Good morning, everyone. If you recall, last time we talked about the post main sequence evolution and deaths of uh, high mass stars. We saw that those stars become red or blue supergiants, depending on their masses. And we saw that they um, pass through a number of different phases of fusion in their cores, ultimately producing iron, leading to a degenerate iron core that eventually collapses, triggering a type 2 supernova. Sometimes in that supernova explosion, a neutron star is formed that is a remnant of the core of the star, uh, and we talked somewhat about those properties of neutron stars. The very last point that was made is that for these neutron stars, that neutron stars uh, have a number of related phenomena, including, for example, um, pulsars. We talked a little bit about pulsars. And we specifically talked about what's called an X-ray pulsar. So just, just to remind you, in the case of a neutron star that forms in a close binary system, this is not an unusual phenomenon is that matter will be transferred from the companion star, which might be a main sequence star, it might be a red giant, it could be just about anything. And that as that matter swirls around the neutron star and falls onto the surface of the neutron star, because of the very intense surface gravity of neutron stars, remember a neutron star has a surface gravity about 200 billion times stronger than the surface gravity on Earth, but that matter undergoes basically instantaneous fusion, but the matter is falling preferentially onto the magnetic poles of the neutron star because of the magnetic field, and this forms an intense beam of X-rays that if that beam sweeps past Earth, we see a pulsing source of X radiation. What is more important, however, is that in this case, the mass of the neutron star is continuously increasing. Right? So as matter is transferred from the companion star onto the neutron star, the mass of the neutron star grows. However, because neutron stars are a form of degenerate matter, just as with white dwarfs, there is a maximum possible mass that any neutron star can have. And that uh, is described by the principles of degeneracy. Now, because neutron stars are supported by neutron degeneracy, as opposed to white dwarfs being supported by electron degeneracy, the maximum mass for a neutron star is greater than the maximum mass for a white dwarf. This is largely because neutrons as particles are much more massive, about a thousand times more massive than electrons. So when accelerated to very high 
uh, momenta, the pressure produced by neutrons is much more powerful than the pressure produced by electrons. As it turns out, the maximum mass for a neutron star is somewhere around three solar masses. Now, the exact value is not well understood because neutrons as particles are much more complex than electrons. Electrons are primary particles. That means you cannot break an electron down into smaller particles. But protons are not primary particles. Protons are made up of even smaller particles called quarks. And so how neutrons behave in degenerate matter is much more complex than the way electrons behave. But the mass limit is generally accepted to be around three times the mass of the sun. And any, for any mass greater than three solar masses, the gravitational force compressing the neutron star will be stronger than the neutron degeneracy pressure supporting its weight. So in the case of a binary system, as we described, if, or, or I should say, as matter continues to be transferred onto the neutron star, and as the mass of the neutron star grows more and more and more, once that mass exceeds three solar masses, neutron degeneracy pressure is no longer able to support the weight of the neutron star, and as grows art, the neutron star begins to collapse. The difference between this and other collapses we've discussed up till now is that some force, some other force, kicked in to stop the collapse. However, in the case of a collapsing neutron star, the gravitational force compressing it is now stronger than any other force in nature. Now, gravity is normally not the strongest force in nature. Let's take, for example, in this room right now. Of all the natural forces that exist, gravity is the weakest of them all. If we compare it, say, to the electromagnetic force. The electromagnetic force is the force responsible for holding molecules together. Electromagnetic force in this room right now is around 10 to the 20 times stronger than gravity. So gravity is an exceedingly weak force under what you and I would consider to be normal conditions, in other words, in this room right now. But as you compress more and more and more matter into a smaller and smaller volume, the gravitational force grows stronger and stronger and stronger. The more mass there is, the stronger gravity is, the smaller the radius, the smaller or the larger gravity is. And so at, by the time you get to a white dwarf, gravity is pretty strong. By the time you get to a neutron star, gravity is much stronger. And once you go past neutron star, once you compress matter beyond a neutron star, at that point, Gravity is stronger than the electromagnetic force. It's stronger than the strong nuclear force, which is responsible for holding atomic nuclei together. It's stronger than any other known force in nature, which means that once the neutron star begins to collapse, no known force in nature can stop it. And the collapse continues and continues and continues. So once the neutron star begins to collapse in on itself, it collapses more and more and more and more and more until it vanishes from our universe. Except it can't just vanish. What happens is the neutron star at this point collapses to become a black hole. Hey, we're finally there. <laughs> Probably the one and only reason that you took this class is to talk about black holes. We finally got to black holes. How many weeks into the semester now? Unfortunately, 
we're a little bit behind schedule compared to where we need to be at this point, so I'm going to skip black holes this semester and we're going to move on. <laughs> no, I'm not going to do that. So we can now talk about black holes. But before we actually talk about black holes uh, specifically, there are three different varieties of black holes that exist. What we're talking about right now in the scenario that we just described of matter being transferred onto a neutron star, that produces what we call a stellar mass black hole. And as we'll see in just a moment, there's several different scenarios that lead to the formation of a stellar mass black hole. But other categories of black holes include what are called primordial black holes, which are microscopic, uh, and to my knowledge have not actually been observed. They're theoretically predicted, but have not yet been observed. We're not really gonna talk about those uh, this semester. And then a third category of black holes is what we call supermassive black holes. And we will talk about them a little bit over the course of the next few lectures. But right now we're focused primarily on stellar mass black holes. The scenario that we just described of mass being transferred onto the surface of a neutron star is one of the scenarios that leads to the formation of a stellar mass black hole, but it's not the only scenario. For instance, for stars with masses between roughly 20 to 50 times the mass of the sun, when those stars undergo the core collapse to produce a type two supernova, a neutron star is not formed. Instead, when the core of that star collapses, it goes past neutron star straight to black hole. So the star explodes, and what remains behind is now a newly formed black hole. For stars with masses greater than around 50 times the mass of the sun, the entire star basically just collapses to form a black hole. And then um, a, another possibility are two neutron stars merging together. So if you have two high mass stars in a binary star system, and this is not a rare thing, you have two stars of maybe 20 or 30 solar masses, each of those two stars will eventually form into a neutron star. And you have two neutron stars orbiting each other but because of the intense tidal forces involved, the orbit decays, the two neutron stars spiral together, getting closer and closer and closer until eventually they merge. When you add the masses of the two neutron stars together, that pushes them over the three solar mass limit and they collapse to form a black hole. And this incidentally has been observed. Just a few years ago, the very first detection of what are called gravitational waves were, was made uh, as a result of two neutron stars merging and collapsing into a black hole. So each of these scenarios is observed and confirmed in nature. But regardless of how you get to that point, once the mass uh, collapses to form a black hole, the mass itself forms what we call a singularity. The basic idea of a singularity is that it is a single mathematical point. Now you can talk about it mathematically in mathematical terms, but remember we're now talking about a physical object. A physical object that has no spatial dimensions. Right, so keep in mind that the world in which you and I live, the world that we inhabit and the world that we perceive is defined by three spatial dimensions that are easily illustrated with the corner of this demonstration table. Right, so the demonstration table has uh, width or left right, it has depth or forward back, and it has height up and down. And each of these dimensions is perpendicular to the other two, right? So left, right is perpendicular to forward, back, and it is perpendicular to up, down. Up, down is perpendicular to left, right, and forward, back, and so on. 
So every object that you and I encounter in our lives occupies all three of these dimensions, whether it is a cylindrical object, whether it's a cubicle or a rectangular object, whatever it is, it occupies all three dimensions. But a singularity occupies none of them. For example, in order to have length, which is one dimension, what do you have to have? What are the minimum number of particles that you, or not particles, uh, the minimum number of points that you must have to have one dimension? Two, right? In order to form a line, you need a minimum of two points, a starting point and an ending point. And usually there's lots of points in between, yeah? And to have two dimensions, you need a minimum of three points. And to have three dimensions, you need a minimum of four points. But a singularity is one point, not two. So it has no length, it has no width, it has no height, the volume is exactly zero, and the radius, by definition, is exactly zero. So the singularity has no physical dimensions, it occupies no space, which leads to an intriguing question. Is an object that occupies no space at all still part of our universe that is defined at least partly by three-dimensional space? And the answer is simply yes. The singularity is still part of our universe, as we will see in a moment, because it still has a very definite effect and influence on the space and objects near it. Okay. So to describe the physical properties of the singularity is that first of all, it has mass. Even though it occupies zero volume, it occupies no space, whatever the mass of the progenitor object was, whether it's a neutron star or a high mass star or whatever it was, that mass that collapses to form the singularity is still present. The mass does not decrease the mass can only increase as a result of more mass falling onto the surface, or I should say, into the black hole. So for instance, in this scenario, when the neutron star collapses to form a black hole, the mass will continue to grow as long as that star keeps feeding mass into the newly formed black hole. So the mass of the singularity can increase, but it will not decrease. When we measure the masses of black holes in binary star systems, and there are a number of examples where this has been done, the lowest measured mass of any black hole is about 3.3 times the mass of the sun, above that mass limit for neutron stars. And remember, the highest mass neutron star that has been observed is about 2.7 below that three solar mass limit. So in this regard, observations in theory match very well. Right, so if we detected a black hole in a binary star system and we measured its mass and it was 1.2 solar masses, that would be a big problem because that doesn't match what theory expects. But that hasn't happened. So observation and theory are consistent with each other and in science, that's typically a good sign. That means that we are on the right track. We don't understand all details, but the basics of the theory, the basics of the model are sound, okay? So the singularity has mass. It also has angular momentum. The neutron star was spinning maybe very, very rapidly, and as it collapses, it starts to spin even faster, and that angular momentum is still present. But what does it mean to say that an object with zero volume is spinning? It has no physical dimension, so how can it be spinning? I don't really have a good answer for that, except to say that we know that it is spinning because as the singularity itself spins, it drags space with it. And we can see that effect on space. And of course, if it has mass, 
it has gravity. Now, as it turns out, what we call classical gravity or Newtonian gravity doesn't work for black holes. But I don't want to get into general relativity, at least not in any significant way in this class, partly because it's really complex and mostly because I'm not a general relativity expert. So we will confine ourselves to classical gravity, Newtonian gravity, and remember this describes gravitational force. So as mass increases, gravity gets stronger because mass is in the numerator. At the same time, as radius decreases, gravity gets stronger. So what is the radius of a singularity? Zero. 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 And what do you get when you divide by zero? Zero. 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 Not zero. It's a number undefined. All right, who said undefined? Okay, so that is what a mathematician would say. And the reason a mathematician would say that is because mathematicians are cowards. <laughs> a real man, a scientist, knows how to divide by zero. When you divide by zero, you don't get undefined, you get infinity. So what is implied by zero radius is that the gravitational force at the position of the singularity is infinitely strong. But the fact is that the a value of infinity is kind of useless. We don't know what to do with infinity. If the force was truly infinitely strong, well, what does that mean? We don't really know what that means. We don't know what to do with it. So it's not useful to describe the gravity precisely at the location of the singularity, but what we can do is we can describe the, the gravity near the singularity, not at the singularity, but near it. So imagine, well, let's first define a volume of space surrounding the singularity. Right, so if this dot represents the singularity itself, then at the actual position of the singularity, the gravitational force implied by this would be infinitely strong. However, what if you're not exactly at the singularity? What if you're a meter away or 10 meters or 100 meters? The number doesn't matter. What if r is not zero? If r is not zero, is the gravitational force infinite. No. So we can describe the gravity near the singularity without getting into these infinities that are a real problem to deal with. So at some distance away from the singularity, the gravitational force is non-infinite and describable. And what we do is we describe a specific distance away from the singularity represented by R sub S, where R sub S stands for what we call the Schwarzschild radius. So we define that specifically as the distance from the singularity where the escape speed is exactly equal to the speed of light. Earlier in the semester, we described escape speed for the first time. Just to refresh your memory, this is the equation for escape speed. Escape speed depends on mass and radius. Question? But even then, light still struggles to get out of the black hole, right? Uh, it doesn't struggle, it fails. Yeah, that's what I meant. Because at this distance, the escape speed is exactly equal to the speed of light. And everywhere closer than that, in other words, everywhere inside of this sphere, the escape speed is greater than the speed of light. Now, what can go faster than the speed of light? Nothing. Hmm? Nothing. 
Nothing. No phenomenon that we know of is able to travel faster than the speed of light, which means everywhere closer than R sub s to the singularity, even light itself is trapped by the gravity of the singularity. And nothing can emerge or escape from within this region. And it is this region, this region of space, which is three-dimensional, this region of space within which the escape speed is greater than the speed of light is what we define to be the black hole. Called black hole because not even light, the fastest phenomenon in the universe, is able to escape from the gravity of the singularity. So in this expression for escape speed, what we're going to do is we're simply going to replace escape speed with the speed of light, square both sides, and solve for r. And so this gives us basically the size of the black hole. The Schwarzschild radius gives us the size of the black hole, and it depends on one and only one property, the mass of the singularity. Remember, g is a constant. The speed of light is a constant. So the radius of a black hole depends only on mass, and it depends linearly on mass. So for a three solar mass black hole, the radius is nine kilometers, or if you prefer, the diameter would be 18 kilometers. For a 10 solar mass black hole, the radius would be 30 kilometers, and again, it increases linearly. So if you double the mass, the radius is double. If you triple the mass, the radius is triple. Okay? Uh, this is called the Schwarzschild radius because I think his first name was Carl. There are actually two Schwarzschilds, father and son. I think it was Carl Schwarzschild who first calculated this. That's why it's called the Schwarzschild radius. Schwarzschild was a German astrophysicist, the first one to calculate the size of a black hole. Okay, So this is how we define the black hole, is that region of space within which the escape speed is greater than the speed of light. The, event, the uh, um, Schwarzschild radius is the distance where the escape speed is exactly equal to the speed of light in anywhere outside of the Schwarzschild radius, there the escape speed is less than the speed of light. So light that is generated outside of the Schwarzschild radius, in principle, can escape from the gravity of the singularity. However, the light is affected, it's redshifted, but it is able to escape. But not from the Schwarzschild radius or closer. Okay? Any questions about this so far? Okay. Now, the Schwarzschild radius, yes? Well, it would be in the geometric center of the of the Schwarzschild radius. So again, the Schwarzschild radius is a spherical region surrounding the singularity, and so the center is the geometric center of that sphere. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So the Schwarzschild radius is a name, a term that's often used by astronomers and physicists, but it is known more commonly by a different name. You have probably heard it described as the event horizon. I'm not sure why that W, that N looks like a W. Let's fix it. There we go. So event horizon, a more common name for the Schwarzschild radius, which basically defines the surface of the black hole. This is not a physical surface, but it is the effective surface of the black hole. Now, event horizon, as it turns out, is also the name of a movie. 
Have any of you ever seen the movie Event Horizon? I see a thumbs up. I see a hand up. Well, I will make a commentary that the movie Event Horizon is one of the worst science fiction movies ever made. <laughs> Not because of its production value, but because the science is so bad. <laughs> If you have not seen the movie Event Horizon, that's a good thing because it's just going to be a waste of your time. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and spoil it for you right now so that you won't waste your time. The entire premise of the movie is, first of all, there's an advanced spacecraft that uses a black hole for propulsion. But things go wrong because where does the singularity go? According to the movie, the singularity goes straight to hell. <laughs> and there, there's just lots and lots of gore in the movie. So don't waste your time. It's a stupid movie. And I will tell you right now, singularities do not go to hell. <laughs> All right? So forget about the movie. Let's talk about the event horizon itself. So what is... Um, first of all, why do we call it the event horizon? So first of all, we need to talk a little bit about what does the word horizon mean? We talked about horizon early in the semester when we were talking about the sky, the appearance of the sky, zenith, meridian, horizon, things like that. So let's consider the surface of the earth. Now we happen to be right here in San Diego. We have a, a harbor, we have a port, we have lots of ships that come and go. If you are standing over at the beach and you watch a ship leave San Diego sailing west, whether it's going to Hawaii or Japan or somewhere over there, as you watch that ship sail away toward the west, can you see that ship all the way to Japan? No. no. Why not? The horizon. The curve because the, curve. the surface of the earth is curved. So as you stand here in San Diego and you watch the ship sailing away, as it moves farther and farther, it's following the curvature of the surface of the Earth, and at some point, the curvature of the surface of the Earth takes that ship below your line of sight. Right? So you cannot see anything over here because the curvature of the Earth pulls it below this point right here. That is your horizon. Now that's assuming a perfectly smooth earth. Of course, there are mountains and things in the way. But when you're far out at sea, that's the closest thing you have to a, a precise, perfect horizon. When you're uh, on land, your local horizon is complicated by buildings and trees and mountains and things like that. But assuming a perfectly smooth earth, the horizon is defined very, very simply. So in other words, the horizon is the point where the curvature of Earth carries objects beyond your line of sight. Okay? So that's the basic idea of what a horizon is. So why do we call this, the event horizon, a horizon? In order to address that, we do have to talk a little bit about the general theory of relativity. So in 1905, Albert Einstein published his special theory of relativity. We've used some results from that over the course of the semester. E equals mc squared. The speed of light is a constant. A few other ideas. A few years later, in 1915, Einstein published his general theory of relativity, which included an updated description of gravity, among other things. So remember, way back when Johannes Kepler 
described how the planets orbit the sun, which he did in 1620, people asked him, hey, Kepler, why do the planets orbit that way around the sun? And Kepler's only honest answer was, I don't know why, they just do. Then, later that century, in 1687, along came Isaac Newton, and Isaac Newton described gravity. Why do the planets orbit the sun the way they do? He said, because of gravity. Because there's this gravitational force that exists between all objects of mass, the mass of the sun, the mass of the planet, the gravitational force determines how they orbit. And people asked Newton, okay, so why does mass produce gravity? And Newton's only honest answer was, I don't know why, it just does. And this is how it does. And from 1687 until 1915, we, nobody knew why mass produces gravity. But in 1915, Albert Einstein answered the question, why does mass produce gravity? And what Newton told, or not Newton, what Einstein told us in 1915 is that the presence of mass alters the shape of space itself. Another uh, product of general relativity is also that space and time are not separate. And so to, in today's lecture, we're going to use the term space-time, because another result of Einstein's work is that space and time are part of the same thing. In, New in Newtonian physics, space and time are completely separate. They're independent of each other. But in Einstein's relativity, time and space are integrated into the same fabric. And that seems to be accurate. Now to illustrate this basic idea, we can take a look at this slide that illustrates how different masses affect the curvature of space. Now in this example, of course, we are challenged in the following way. That we exist in three-dimensional space. And we cannot depict the curvature of that space, period. Because the curvature, where does the singularity go? As it collapses more and more and more and more, where does that mass go? It still has mass, right? But where is that mass? The answer is, it is nowhere in our three dimensions. Where does it go? It goes into the fourth spatial dimension. Not time. Time is not the fourth dimension. Some people say time is the fourth dimension. No, time is not the fourth dimension. Time is part of the three dimensions of our space, the four dimensions of our space. In fact, according to Einstein's equations, there are 13 dimensions of space, of which you and I can perceive only three. So, Again, our three dimensions are our space are illustrated by the corner of this demonstration table. Left, right, forward, back, up, and down. But there is another direction that is perpendicular to all three simultaneously. Right? I cannot point to it because it is beyond our perception. But there is another direction that is perpendicular to left, right, and perpendicular to forward, back, and perpendicular to up and down all at the same time. No matter what direction I hold a ruler, that will not be true. But there is a fourth spatial dimension that exists. Now, to try to demonstrate this, what this diagram shows is a flat two-dimensional universe. 
a universe that is defined only by left, right, forward, back, like the surface of a table, or even better, the surface of a trampoline. How many of you have ever been on a trampoline? Most people have. And before you climb on the trampoline, the surface is flat, right? But the instant you climb onto it and stand in the middle of the trampoline, what happens to the shape of the trampoline? It is distorted. There's a dimple centered on you. So that two-dimensional universe described by the surface of the trampoline is warped into what dimension? The third dimension. So the presence of mass, a little bit of mass causes a little bit of curvature, more mass causes more curvature, and even more mass causes even more curvature on the trampoline. In order to relate this now to gravity, we have to increase everything by one dimension. So the presence of mass in space-time curves space-time into the next higher dimension, which is at least the fourth dimension, and perhaps more than that. Now, this is completely and utterly counterintuitive, because again, you and I cannot perceive the fourth dimension. It is beyond our perception, but not beyond our conception. We can conceive of it even if we can't see it. So this is what gravity is. Einstein tells us that gravity is the effect that results from matter being in warped or curved space-time. The greater the curvature, the stronger the gravity is. So imagine that trampoline, right? So you stand in the center of the trampoline and the trampoline is curved around you. What if you took a little ball, softball, racquetball, something, and you put it, set it onto the trampoline? What's it gonna do? It's gonna roll right to you. As if what? It's drawn by gravity. As if your gravity is pulling the ball toward you. So as objects move through a gravitational field, they are following the local curvature of space-time. Right, this is what grab, this is what Einstein tells us. Now, this sounds somewhat absurdly hypothetical. Is there any basis to support this idea? And the answer is very definitely yes. So again, Einstein. In 1915, Einstein tells us that gravity is the result of the local curvature of space-time. And as a result of this, Einstein made a prediction. Einstein predicted that light from a distant star, where the star is directly behind the sun, that light from that star would bend around the sun and be visible in the sky next to the sun. Because if space itself is curved, right? If I draw a straight line on a curved surface, is it really a straight line? No. No, it's actually a curved line, right? So what Einstein predicted was that, and it's the same thing that's shown in the projected diagram, but if Earth is here and the Sun is here, for a star that is actually physically located behind the Sun, that light from that star that should not reach the Earth that as that light passes through the curved space near the sun, it follows a curved path and actually reaches the Earth 
making the star appear as though it is next to the sun instead. In other words, he predicted that the starlight would be deflected by a specific angle. Now, he made this prediction. And of course, when he made that prediction, astronomers were all over it. They're like, okay, this is something we can actually test. So when can you see the sun and stars at the same time? Don't say at night. During a total solar eclipse. So there was a total solar eclipse a few months later, uh, not months, a few years later. And in fact, the British astronomer, um, Arthur Eddington, whose name we've mentioned earlier in the semester, Eddington had been in contact with Einstein and Eddington decided that he was going to test this prediction. So the eclipse was going to go across Africa. Eddington led an expedition to a small island off of the west coast of Africa. He set up a bunch of telescopes and cameras to record the eclipse. He actually got there months beforehand to photograph exactly that part of the sky before the sun got there. Because remember, the sun moves in its annual motion. And then, when the eclipse occurred, took more photographs with exactly the same instruments of exactly the same part of the sky and compared the before and during photographs. And what Eddington saw was that the positions of the stars in the photographs were displaced by exactly the angle predicted by Einstein. Exactly what Einstein predicted. So when Eddington got back to civilization, because the island you know, didn't have electricity, didn't have telegrams and things like that, when he got back to uh, a city, he sent a telegram to Einstein, who was still in Germany at that point, and the, the telegram read simply to Einstein from Eddington, congratulations, you are about to become the most famous man in the world. Stop. <laughs> Signed, Eddington. And when Einstein received that telegram, he knew exactly what had happened. He knew that Eddington had confirmed this first major test of the general theory of relativity. And there have been many, many tests of general relativity over the last 107 years. Um, yeah, 107 years. And general relativity has never, ever, not once, failed a test. Every prediction that comes from general relativity has been confirmed. The most recent was the confirmation of gravity waves. Another prediction of Einstein is the presence of gravity waves, waves in space-time that are extremely difficult to detect. Finally, it took us 100 years to do it. We finally figured out how to detect them, and they were detected exactly as predicted by Einstein. So this is pretty well-established physics now. Relativity is pretty well-established physics. And so, we have this idea that gravity is the curvature of space-time, and just as the curvature of the Earth produces a horizon beyond which we cannot see, the curvature of space-time in the vicinity of the singularity is so great, we cannot see past it. That is the limit of vision in the universe, because the curvature of space-time at that point is so great that it carries any object beyond the view of the rest of the universe. It's sort of like a hole in space, where the curvature is basically at the position of the singularity, the curvature is perpendicular to the universe or its infinite curvature. Okay? So this is the basic idea of a black hole. That's why we call the event horizon the event horizon. All right? Now, as I stated, Einstein tells us 
that space and time are the same thing. That space and time are not separate independent phenomena. So if space is curved, guess what? So is time. Time is a variable. And the rate at which time passes depends on the space that you're in. Here on Earth, where the curvature of space is very mild, time passes at one rate. If you're very close to the sun, where space is more curved, time passes at a different rate. And if you're next to a black hole, where space is infinitely curved, time passes at still a different rate. So time does not pass at the same rate in all places in the universe at the same time. Again, this sounds like absurdly theoretical, but guess what? It is absolutely proven. Because how many of you use GPS? Almost everybody uses GPS nowadays. Well, guess what? GPS satellites orbiting the Earth are a couple hundred miles above the surface of the Earth, farther away from the center of curvature of space-time of the Earth. In order for a GPS satellite to give you an accurate navigational location, we actually have to take into account the difference in time. Time on the surface of the Earth passes at one rate, Time at the height of the satellite passes at a different rate. It's called time dilation. And if we do not account for time dilation, your fix on the surface of the Earth is wrong. You will not get the right position. So even GPS satellites that are not that far from the Earth must take into account this effect of general relativity. So absolutely proven and even used in technology. Okay? Go ahead. Oh, not even. So what's the difference in the passage of time in orbit above the Earth versus on the surface of the Earth? It is a tiny, tiny fraction of a second. But still, if you're trying to get an accurate navigational fix, that matters. So technically, and so time is passing faster up there than on the surface of the Earth. Because you're farther away from Earth's gravity. The farther away you are, the faster time passes. The closer you are to the surface of the Earth, the slower time passes. But again, it's a fraction of a second. Over, out of however many, you know, however you want to choose it, you know, a fraction of a second per minute, per hour, whatever. It's a very small effect because the curvature of space around the Earth is not dramatic. But as you approach a black hole, the curvature becomes extreme and the time difference becomes extreme. Go ahead. Um, so like in the picture with the yellow ball and the orange ball, uh -huh. it would take more time to pass to get from the flat plane to the yellow ball, pretty much? Well, so... Okay, let me tell you a story, and then we'll come back to your question. So what does this mean? So let me start with a, an absurdly hypothetical situation. Right? This would never, ever happen in, in reality, but still, let's just kind of go with it, okay? So imagine, if you can, that there is a college astronomy class, and in this college astronomy class, there is a student who is struggling, struggling to pass the class. And so this student goes to the professor and asks, professor, is there any kind of extra credit I can do to help me pass this class? And of course, the professor quite correctly states, no, I do not accept extra credit. But the student is persistent, and the student begs, please, oh please, oh please, let me do some kind of extra credit. I'll do anything, anything for extra credit. And the professor thinks about it for a second and says, anything, huh? All right, I'll tell you what. I will give you five, count them, five whole points of extra credit. <laughs> if you will fly into a black hole 
and let the rest of the class watch to see what happens. And the student says, thank you, thank you, thank you, I'll do it. So, of course, we impose on the engineering students to build us a spacecraft <laughs> to send the student to a black hole. We build mission control on campus, and we send this intrepid, if not misguided, student off to fly to a local black hole, ignoring the amount of time that it would take to travel the distance to a black hole. We watch as the student goes. We have a two-way video feed between the spacecraft and mission control, and we watch what's going on. And for most of the journey, everything seems quite normal. Nothing worth noting is observed by the student or by us. However, as the student approaches the black hole, as the student arrives in the vicinity of the black hole and enters from what we would consider to be normal space into now ever more curved space, we begin to see changes. As we watch the student, we see as the student gets closer and closer and closer to the event horizon, we see time slowing down for the student. His heart rate slows, his respiration slows, the clocks on the spacecraft tick more slowly, the lights on the control panel blink on and off more slowly, time gets slower and slower and slower as the student gets closer and closer and closer to the event horizon until finally, just as the student is on the brink of the event horizon, just as the student is about to cross that event horizon into the black hole, we see time stop. What we see here on Earth is the student frozen in time and no matter how long we wait, we never see the next second pass for that student. The clocks stop on the spacecraft. The student is frozen in time, not dead. But the student will never again blink, never again take a breath. His heart will never again beat. Frozen in time for all eternity. And no matter how long we wait, we never, ever see the student cross the event horizon in the black hole. Which means the student never, ever gets his five points of extra credit, because that was the deal. You have to cross into the black hole, and we never see that occur. So be careful what you agree to. Question? Well, the reality was well, it depends on the mass of the black hole. So for a low mass black hole, three, five, ten solar masses, the student would literally be ripped apart by tidal forces before ever reaching the event horizon. So the student would be stretched, basically spaghettified, and his molecules ripped apart by intense tidal forces. However, if it's a really big black hole, a billion solar masses, you can actually survive because the tidal force, the, the event horizon is so far from the singularity that the tidal forces are now weak and you could actually survive passage into a really massive black hole, but we're talking here about a, so a stellar mass black hole, so no, the student would actually never survive. But I was leaving those details out of it, okay? So we see the student forever trapped, frozen in time on the edge of the event horizon, but that's not the perception of the student. As the student on the spacecraft flies to the black hole. Again, everything seems normal. But as the student gets closer and closer and closer to the event horizon, looking back to the Earth, the student sees the Earth and everybody on the Earth speeding up. Sees his classmates aging before his very eyes. Sees his classmates die and mission control populated by their children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. And as the student gets even closer to the event horizon, witnesses the sun itself 
changing from a main sequence star to a red giant, a super giant, and the Earth is gone. And as the student is even closer to the event horizon, looking across the galaxy, sees stars forming and living and dying before his very eyes, sees all of those low-mass stars becoming helium-white dwarfs and says, I'll be damned, Miller was right. And the very last thing the student sees just before crossing the event horizon is the student witnesses eternity itself, sees the last of the stars dying out, sees the universe end up as a cold, dark soup of subatomic particles. And then he's gone inside the event horizon and what he sees or perceives, assuming he survives the tidal forces, we cannot ever know. So two completely different perceptions. Which one is right? They're both right. That's why it's called relativity. What happens is relative to where you are. On Earth, in close to normal space-time, we see and perceive things one way. Near the black hole, in the infinitely stretched space-time, you see and perceive something else. So as space itself, so if you look at the grid, space gets more and more and more and more stretched, so does time. So one second here on Earth might be a billion years next to the black hole. Okay? So there are these wild implications that go along with these very extreme conditions. And you basically cannot get more extreme than a black hole. Infinitely compressed matter, gravitational and tidal forces approaching infinity, time that stops at the event horizon. And black holes, of course, are not theoretical. They exist. We can detect them in binary star systems. Right? So here we have a black hole that is formed in a binary star system. It pulls gas off of its companion star. The gas swirls around the black hole. That gas is superheated, super compressed by the tidal forces. So if that's the black hole itself, there's the accretion disk surrounding it. The inner part of the accretion disk is extraordinarily hot because of the compression by tidal forces. And that gas emits intense uh, gamma radiation, but the gravity of the black hole stretches the gamma rays into x-rays. And we see these intensely bright point sources of X radiation. The very first one discovered is called Cygnus X1. Discovered back in the 60s or 70s, I don't remember exactly what it was, which was the first ever actual detection of a black hole. At first, we weren't sure what it was, but now we understand it is a black hole in a binary star system. That's one way to detect them. Because, of course, we cannot see the black hole itself. We can only see the stuff near it. This, of course, is an artist's depiction of the accretion disk around the black hole. But we have actually imaged black holes. This is the first ever actual photograph of a black hole. This was 2019. <laughs> and a, a technologically extraordinary accomplishment that if you'd asked me 20 years ago would it ever be possible, I'd say no, it will never be possible. But we did it in 2019. This is the black hole. This is the superheated gas around the black hole at the center of the galaxy M87. It is a super massive black hole around a billion times the mass of our sun and the first ever direct image of a black hole. This shows the scale of the photograph, so that is two one hundred thousandths of an arc second. Basically, this picture 
of that black hole is the equivalent of taking a photograph of a dime on the moon. It's shockingly, shockingly high resolution. Questions? Is it true that like astronomers have such an idea what it would look like for the space specifically? Is what true? Uh, I heard that like just because of the specific nature, I guess all the math you can do, like you have some idea of what it would look like before they took the picture, and then it's kind of confirmed what what they thought it might look like. Well, uh, how many of you saw the movie um, Interstellar? Interstellar, thanks. Um, the science of Interstellar was actually really good. Because among, because one of the advisors, the, one of the technical advisor on the movie was Kip Thorne. Kip Thorne is a physicist at Caltech. He's one of the world experts on black holes. And so he helped the, um, um, the, the um, effects team accurately depict what a black hole would look like. Yeah. So, you know, this, so we had an idea of what black holes would look like if we could see them. And of course, by definition, we cannot actually see the event horizon, right? No light can escape from the black hole itself. So the best that we can do is we can image the stuff around the black hole. But there's a, an empty spot there, right? That's where the black hole itself is. So you would never actually see the event horizon because no light is emerging from the event horizon. But the stuff near the event horizon is radiating light. So remember, the escape speed is less than the speed of light. So for the gas swirling around the black hole, that gas is observed. And we should see something kind of like that. And that's basically what we see. Okay? Now, it seems brighter down here than up there, and it's probably because of the orientation and the fact that you know, light coming from the other side is going to be Doppler shifted by the gravity of the black hole and so probably is outside the wavelength range of this image. That's I'm guessing what's happening here. Um, but yeah, it's consistent with what we would have expected to see. And I don't think, yeah, I didn't put it, I need to update the slides because just, uh, what, uh, last year? They, that same team successfully took a picture of the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy. I, th I actually thought, maybe it's, actually, you know what, I think it might be in a different slide set. Um, let's see. Ah, yeah, so, so this is, um, This is the second ever direct image of a black hole. This is the black hole at the center of our own Milky Way galaxy. So that shows the size of the sun, that shows the size of the orbit of Mercury. This is the accretion disk surrounding the black hole, and of course the black hole would be there uh, at the center of that accretion disk. So it's called Sagittarius A, Sagittarius A, is the brightest X-ray source in the constellation Sagittarius, and it coincides with this uh, supermassive black hole at the very center of our own Milky Way galaxy. So almost all galaxies have a black hole at their center. Not all, but almost all do. Okay? So as we have now discussed, Time is dilated in the vicinity of the black hole. Space-time is stretched, right? So you get extreme time dilation, you get extreme tidal forces in the presence of these black holes. So in reality, no spacecraft could ever survive passage into a stellar mass black hole because the size of the spacecraft is significant compared to the distance from the singularity. That makes the tidal forces 
extraordinarily powerful in the spacecraft, and all the occupants would be ripped apart molecule by molecule by those type of forces. But as I mentioned, for a really big black hole, like at the center of the galaxy, you could, in principle, survive passage into it. But then you're kind of stuck. You can't get back out. So once you go in, you're in forever. Right? Now, you would live out a normal human lifespan inside, but what you experience inside, again, we have no way of really predicting with any kind of, with any kind of uh, realistic description. Okay? Now, one last point to make about black holes is that you know in the movies, in Hollywood, black holes are always, usually always, described as these ravenous beasts devouring everything around them. And that's actually not true. Black holes are quite timid, as it turns out. They're very low key. Yeah, if something is really close, it's going to be attracted by the gravity. But if the sun were to collapse into a black hole, which of course will not happen, the sun is not massive enough to ever become a black hole. One solar mass black holes do not exist. But if the sun became a one solar mass black hole, Earth's orbit around the sun would be completely unaffected. Because after all, what is the Earth orbiting right now? The sun. A one solar mass thing. Does it matter if it's a one solar mass main sequence star, a one solar mass white dwarf, a one solar mass black hole, or a one solar mass one solar mass mass marshmallow? No. As long as it's one solar masses, the Earth's orbit would continue exactly the way it works now. So all of these extreme effects of time dilation and this curvature of space, that only happens really close to the event horizon, right? And what's the event horizon of a three solar mass black hole? Nine kilometers radius. Right? So you have to be within you know, just a few kilometers of the black hole before these really extreme things begin to occur, okay? So black holes are not these ravenous beasts devouring the entire universe. That is entirely Hollywood. It's not the reality. As I already mentioned, black holes are observed in binary systems. They're observed in the centers of spiral galaxies and giant elliptical galaxies. All right? So any questions about black holes? So that fits into the overall stellar evolutionary scheme. So this slide basically gives you a quick one-stop summary of stellar depth. We did not talk about brown dwarfs. Brown dwarfs are failed stars. They're not massive enough ever for fusion to begin. They never become main sequence stars. They're basically really big Jupiters. They don't do anything, which is why I don't talk about them, because they're really boring. But low mass stars up to about half the mass of the sun, eventually, this isn't labeled property, but eventually they become helium white dwarfs, but not for trillions of years into the future. Stars like the sun become a red giant, red supergiant, shed a planetary nebula, and end up as a carbon and oxygen white dwarf. These stars become Supergiants explode, produce a neutron star. These become blue supergiants, explode, and produce a black hole. So a one quick overview of post-main sequence stellar evolution, which depends on mass and how the different stellar end states are related. Okay? So that ends, unless there are questions, that completes our section on stellar evolution, which personally I find to be one of the most interesting parts of astronomy. This now leads us to the next major topic, which is now next to discuss our galaxy. So we've talked about stars, we've talked about nebulae, although not in great detail. We've talked about the nebulae associated with stellar formation, 
We've talked about the nebulae associated with stellar death. All of these things, stars and nebulae, populate our galaxy, the Milky Way. So that's the next topic for us to discuss. With four minutes left in class, we won't start that today. So Thursday morning, we will begin by discussing the Milky Way. <laughs>